Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Today in New York City, Toronto Maple Leafs defenseman Morgan Riley meeting with Commissioner Gary Bettman to appeal a five-game suspension for a cross-check delivered to Ridley Gregg over the weekend. If you want to hear our thoughts on all of that, you could check out our last episode and the discourse we had around that. Uh, but but I but I really want more info from you, see John, what's to come from this meeting today and what we could expect to hear a verdict on this appeal from Morgan Riley. Well, I think the fact that the appeal is being held on on Friday at noon is a positive thing for Morgan Riley. Typically, it takes Gary Bettman about one to three days to, to render a decision after this type of hearing. And, and the reason I bring that up is that even if it takes three days in this situation, that would mean that the, the ruling comes down on Tuesday. And in the event that Gary Bettman does drop a game off this suspension, which I think is possible, uh, that would mean that Morgan Riley could rejoin the Leafs lineup on Wednesday in Arizona uh, without having missed too many games. And, and you know, that might seem like kind of why all these details. Well, you know, the truth is, is that timing is kind of an issue in these matters. Uh, you might remember the appeal that David Perron launched in December for his six game suspension. The day that Gary Bettman came down with the ruling in that case, and he did uphold that suspension. So it's maybe moot, but Perron had already served all six games. So even if, if, if Bettman had to said, well, I reduce it to five games or four games, well, he would have still missed six games. Uh, he would have got a little more money back and he may still yet because he's going to a neutral arbitrator. But yeah, you know, I think for Morgan Riley's uh, situation, this is a best case scenario and that the circumstances are there that if, if there's, you know, compelling enough testimony at the hearing, or if Batman's review of the facts available, you know, wants to see him knock a game off. Um, you know, I think that, that, you know, Riley could get back in after only missing four games. And, you know, I, I also bring this up because there's, there's not a lot of precedent over the years, Julian, of Bettman reducing his suspension. But in the one case he did with Jason Spezza in December 2021, uh, you know, the biggest thing he noted in, in the reason he took Spezza's suspension at the time from six games to four was just that he had, you know, basically there, there was no dispute about the fact he'd had a long, long career, never really any examples of crossing the line or any pattern of behavior that needed to be stamped out. And, you know, Riley hasn't been in the league as long as Spezza had at that point, but you know, he's over 800 games when you count playoffs. It's 11 seasons. You know, he's he's finished fourth uh, previously in the Lady Bing Trophy voting for most gentlemanly player in the league. He didn't take a penalty this year till January 14th. He has nine cross-checking minors his entire career. That's 11-year career, so less than one a year. I'm not defending the action of Morgan Riley. You know, I think I was pretty clear in our Monday episode. Um I guess it was a Tuesday episode this week, man. We're all up is down. Yeah. But our, sorry, our pre- guys. The schedule's a bit weird. Yeah. I know consistency is key. We've not been consistent with you. I'm sorry, our loyal listeners, but we were going to get back on schedule here next week. Um, you know, but I was consistent then and saying, look, this is a suspendable act. No question. But, you know, given that history, you know, four games, if it ends up being four, it is still a pretty severe suspension. It's going to cost Morgan Riley a lot of money. It's four games. The Leafs are without their, their, the player that plays the most ice time on the team. And so all that together, that's why they're in New York City. That's why it was worth flying down, because I do think that there's a chance here for Morgan Riley to get a, na- a game knocked off the suspension. Um, we probably won't know maybe the weekend, but probably early next week, you know, if Gary Bettman concurs with that. But I do think there's at least a case there. There's precedent. This isn't some crazy gamble by them uh, or, wa- or a clear giant waste of time or anything like that. What do you think of how this story has kind of, blown up basically all week we, we even henrik lundquist on on nhl on tnt gave his opinion on 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 the incident and, and obviously ottawa senators players have spoken about what it did I, think Brad, say? I, think, I didn't actually see his response or, or what is basically just it's just him saying he didn't think the ridley greg uh slap shot was a big deal right like he's he's in that camp uh brady kachuk uh was on a stream uh this week i'm not sure for which game but he thought the whole thing was hilarious but of course that's his teammate uh, but but just the fact that, I mean, we're starting to see players weigh in. Uh, we've discussed the fact that fans and, and media have discussed the story. I'm just curious from your from from your view, like, what do you think of how massive the story has blown up? 
Well, I mean, it touched a nerve clearly. And, and I think what's interesting to me is that it's, it's almost cut along generational lines. You know, when, when you see some of the commentary, I mean, even what Ryan Reeves, you know, said in the Toronto media, you know, a lot of where he was coming from there, obviously in this case, Riley's his teammate. So he's defending his guy too, but he was, you know, he was talking about in my day, this wouldn't have happened. Right. I mean, that, that was to boil down his comments. That was what he was saying about, you know, Greg taking the original slap shot, you know, John Tortorella wasn't maybe weighing in specifically on the exact incident, but he did give a pretty thoughtful long answer about how he's seen the game evolve and change how young players maybe are a little bit different than, than when he first started coaching in the NHL. And so it has almost become a little bit of a, a generational or an age related thing, the way some people have reacted. I mean, obviously there's, there's, there's people, uh, you know, reacting based on which team they happen to like or hate in this circumstance too. But, um, you know, I, it's, it's been an interesting kind of play out and, and it's kind of hilarious how it all works. I mean, even from just a hockey standpoint, you would have thought this was going to be an absolute disaster for the Leafs. You know, they missed a couple of players this week with, you know, significant players with illness. And yet they've won the first two games without Riley in the lineup. And on Saturday, they play Anaheim, who's right near the bottom of the standings. I mean, no guarantee for a win, but but the point is they're they're in a position to actually compile a pretty good record here, even with Riley out of the lineup. And, um, you know, I, I, I can see where, you know, I, I basically, I, I think Evander Kane, might have had the most reasoned take of anyone that I saw on this. And someone in the group chat pointed out that Vander Kane could probably see himself on both sides of the equation. Like he, he could have been the guy slapping the puck in the net or the guy retaliating to someone slapping a puck into an empty net. Um, but basically he said Greg was right to do what he did. He doesn't see any problem with Riley wanting to defend his, his teammates. And look at this is a lot of, it's created a lot of attention, discussion, something to talk about and that's that's kind of fun and debate about and that's kind of fun for the league so you know i think i I can kind of land in that camp too just because greg you know wasn't injured in this case um can't be using a stick as a weapon can't be having your stick up around people's heads um but you know greg has played both games since this happened for ottawa scored and in tuesday's win over columbus and so i think it's the fact that there wasn't really harsh outcomes has made it something that can be debated a little bit more because we're not you know, it would seem it would seem a little weird to be taking any other side if Greg had been injured seriously in that in that play. One other topic of this story I want to get to the suspension number. Can you think of any other time with a player being suspended where the number somehow leaked before the Department of Player Safety could get it out? Well, it used to be routine. I, I would say, you know, if you, I'm going back ten to fifteen years, but you know, I, I I worked at that time with Nick Kiprios at Sportsnet, and I recall Nick quite often maybe not getting it half an hour before, which I think was roughly the timeline here uh, that, that Kevin Weeks reported. It was a five game suspension before even the parties involved were notified. I mean, that, that was a significant part of this um, just from a sort of standpoint of, you know, Kevin Weeks had put out, it was a five game suspension and and the people directly involved hadn't been told that yet. And so I think that there's, you know, and look, in today's day and age, information can spread so fast, um, you know, but I, I don't think that that was appreciated by everyone that, 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 that that's how it played out. I mean, I, we're not, you know, throwing any darts at Kevin Weeks here. He's doing his job. I can tell you with certainty if, if the right person or people told me it was five games, I would have in the exact same circumstance as him, you know, tweeted the same, same information. Um, so no, no suggestion here that he did anything wrong, but you know, I think that the problem with, with the way this things go, I mean, look, there's, there's a ton of eyeballs and interest and media people like myself sniffing around on this kind of suspension, obviously because of the attention it's receiving, you know, whereas some suspensions I don't think are under the same level of scrutiny and interest. And then a lot of people have to be looped in on a decision like this, right? That they had a hearing, um, you know, they make the video explaining, you know, where the justification comes um, for the supplemental discipline. And, and I just think a wide net of people probably know that. And some, sometimes that information doesn't get kept under the lid. So I can understand why the Leafs didn't like it the way that all played out. But I also, you know, look, it's sort of like trade deadline day. And, you know, sometimes unfortunately players are going to find out they were dealt by people like myself or Darren Dreger, um, maybe on Twitter, maybe if they're watching the, the TV coverage we're going to have uh, on Trade Center. I mean, I 
I don't like that. I don't think it's perfect, but sometimes that's the way it goes. Right. And so ultimately I don't think it's the end of the world, but in the moment when, when emotions were already high, just with, you know, around the whole process that, that didn't help anything. I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, last one for you then. Can you paint more of a picture of how the Leafs have been handling all of this w- with regards to the suspension announcement and, and also how they've been playing in Morgan Riley's absence? Well, you know, they started the week pretty hot about it all. It was, you know, it was clear, you know, you had Sheldon Keith mentioning the, the Toronto factor and obviously Ryan Reeves' comments. I mean, it just behind the scenes there, I know there was a lot of exasperation that, that they just couldn't, they couldn't even wrap their minds around the possibility it would be a five game suspension at that time. I think cooler heads have prevailed. It's again, it probably hasn't hurt the fact that they played one of their better games of the year and probably against St. Louis on Tuesday. And, and I say improbably because they, they missed John Tavares and Mitch Marner in that game with illness. Um, you know, obviously losing Riley too. I mean, it's three of their five best players were out of the lineup and St. Louis came in having one seven of eight in that game. And so it just, it didn't look like it was setting up for a good night for the Leafs. And, and lo and behold, it was the blues who had a tough game. They only had 15 shots on net and, and, you know, Toronto won it going away. They managed to then sneak out another win against Philadelphia on, on Thursday. And so that probably calms temperature. Obviously the passing of time does as well. And, you know, we even had a moment where Brad Living was supposed to, you know, address the Leafs media on Wednesday, you know, once Riley launched his appeal, I think, basically true living came to the conclusion there was going to be way too many questions asked in that avail that he couldn't answer. And so he just decided to call it off. I'm sure at some point in time, it will be addressed more formally by the lease once they know how this appeal goes. And I do think that there is genuine hope that they might at least get one game knocked off here. I mean, no one can say that with any certainty, the, the appeal to be clear to anyone who doesn't understand the process is entirely at Gary Bettman's discretion. So, I mean, how could we sit here it's two and a half hours before this hearing is supposed to start and say how Gary Bettman, what he's going to hear in that hearing, how he's going to view it. But I do think if you look closely at that Spets example, there's at least there's a path there where you can talk yourself into the fact that maybe Morgan Riley will get a similar pardon. Um, and so it, everything's calmed down with a couple wins with a couple days to digest information. And I think now with the, at least a faint hope, I'll call it a faint hope, that maybe Riley will will actually see the suspension knocked back a game. Siege, can we spare a minute and talk about Austin Matthews and how incredible his season has been so far? He hits he gets that natural hat trick the other night. He's on pace for over 70 goals. This is a different level for a player who keeps getting better and better and better every year that he plays. Let's talk about him for a minute. I mean, he's got 31 goals in the last 30 games played. So, I mean, not many players ever do that over any 30 game stretch. It's reminiscent of a couple seasons ago where he had 51 goals and 50 games played in the middle of of that year when he had a 60 goal season. And, you know, where it kind of hit home for me is, is that was his fifth hat trick of the season on Thursday night against Philadelphia. Alex Ovechkin, the greatest goal scorer probably ever, certainly of this era, as has only ever had four maximum in a year and there's still 30 games to play. So there's still, there's still obviously ample opportunity for Austin to add to that. So yeah, you know, the other part of it is not a lot of his goals. And I don't say this like as any point of criticism are really highlight real goals, right? Like, like what I find most amazing about the way Austin Matthews scores or kind of the way he's evolved. Like, I think I, I'm not saying this has always been the case. I think he's kind of changed along the way. Uh, you know, goalies adjust to him. He's adjusting what he does, but he just can beat goalies clean. Now when they, like, they see the shot, it's not a tip. It's not a, it's not a big screen, but there's something about the way he releases the puck or the way he disguises what he's going to do that. He just, it's almost like he leaves goalies guessing and they're guessing wrong. And and certainly a couple of the goals against Samuel Larson of the flyers were like that uh, on Thursday. And so yeah, there's there's certainly no goal scorer like him. The, the Leafs have really needed it this year. I mean, uh, Austin and, and William Nylander scored in overtime in that game. Have have both had you know really strong offensive seasons for Toronto. Mitch Marner's maybe a little off where you'd expect him to be. John Tavares is is you know he's still an effective player. Like I think it's easy. There's, there's sort of a it's easy to say like oh it's going terribly for him. But but you know obviously he's in some period of of you know probably age related decline. 
in terms of his production. You know, it hasn't helped the Leafs power play hasn't been as effective. And Tavares, when you, when you look at it has, has probably been their best power play player in terms of producing goals. And so anyway, I mean, it's, it's very much needed, I guess, is my point uh, for this team. And, you know, Austin continues to play a really strong defensive game too. I, I don't see a lot of evidence of him cheating for that offense. And, and, you know, he's, he might be at the peak this year. I mean, this, this might be as, as good as it gets. And I, and I have to tell you, it's probably about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago here locally in Toronto, you started to hear the 70 goal talk a little bit, or I get that question on, on radio or whatever. And I, at that point I felt it was a little premature. I mean, he was on pace for 70, but there was so much season left to go. But now when you get to 45 and 51 games, um, the Leafs have 30 games left. Like I can, I can start to talk myself into the, the debate, the conversation, what have you. And, and as it, as it stands right now, he's actually on pace for 71 goals as we're sitting here today. And so that, that would be a pretty crazy achievement. It's only seven or eight guys in NHL history that have ever got to that mark. I think even getting to 65 or above that is probably a, a target that's in the back of Matthews's mind, just because that was Ovechkin's best individual season. Uh, we saw Connor McDavid get close last year, but not quite to that level. And so I think even to get to 66 goals, which might seem like a random number to throw out there is, is a pretty significant achievement because nobody in, has really, I mean, no, no one has threatened that other than Ovechkin. And even the year he got to 65, that, you know, that, that was pretty something special. So um, that's a long winded answer, but I, I think that you're seeing Matthews at his absolute best in all areas of the ice right now. And uh, the Leafs, the Leafs need it. This is, this team is not as strong as the ones of previous seasons at this point. And I think they've been able to paper over, you go right back to opening night, Toronto, Toronto scored two goals against Montreal with the goalie pulled and they were both Matthews. Right. I mean, I, I just think they've been able to paper over some of their flaws because of him. And, and, you know, that's why he's going to be the top paid player in the league starting next season. I know that'll be temporary. At some point you're going to have, you know, future contracts for McDavid. Like I'm certainly not saying he's the best player in the league, but he's, he's, he's earning the money he's about to receive uh, with, with his performance. Man, I, I, I cheer for stories. So I'm rooting for Austin Matthews to reach the 70 goal plateau. I just think that would be a fun thing for all of us in media and all of us as hockey fans to chase. And I, I, I've sort of said it before on this show. I'll, I think there's more reason to read it, to reiterate it. Now the Leafs can't waste this type of season, this type of offensive production from Austin Matthews. I know they're not as good as previous teams, but when your best player is playing at such an elite level, I, I don't know. I think you have to do something at the deadline. You have to make this work and not waste this season from him. And I'll, I'll say this and it's not by way of prediction, but like you talk to the Washington capitals and you ask of all the teams you had in the Ovechkin era, which was the best one. I don't think anyone would answer the year they won the cup. I agree. Like, I that. think that, I think that they feel they had better teams other years. And for whatever reason, be it bounces, health, all the things that go into outcomes of games, they didn't win the cup that year. And so I think it would be flawed logic to, to look at the current Leafs and say they can't win just because the previous versions didn't win. You know, I, I'm with you. Like, I, there's a lot of debate in the market too. Like, what do you do with the deadline? I think you, I think you have to push the chips in again. If anything, everybody should be copying Tampa to the degree you can. Look what Julian Breezebaugh has done at all these deadlines, right? He's, he's, he's traded as many first round picks as anyone, but he's typically gotten players that aren't on one year. Like he's not doing that for rentals for the most part, right? He's it's either players with an extra year already under contract or someone he intends to sign and extend. And I think that's the path for the Leafs. I, I think that they should be aggressive in, in trying to, to add to the team. And even at the cost of maybe some of their prospects or, or the first round pick this year, but but try to use it on someone who isn't you know just just walking away when the season ends. If at least if you have next year or or the the chance to extend that player, to me that makes sense. And, and just for the reasons you mentioned, I mean, there's just no way that I can say we're going to be sitting here next year talking about a 70 goal chase. Like I, I think that this is, I, I would hate to make this prediction because you'd be wrong if you ever bet against Austin Matthews scoring goals right from the first day he was in the league. But like this might be this 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 might be it. This might be the the absolute peak of where he is as a goal scorer in the league. I mean, it was pretty exciting a couple of years ago when he was chasing fifty down, and it's like no one's even talking about that now. I mean, he's going to get to fifty before March, 
um, like the fifties anticlimactic at this point. It's, it's, you know, he's looking at video game numbers. So um, you're right. I think it's a good sideshow here <laughs> a little bit, but this is a team that doesn't need any sideshows. They need a lot of victories because they're, they're, <laughs> they're in a wild card spot as we're talking right now. The Toronto Maple Leafs, boring, uninteresting. Never in my life. Never, never in my life. Never, never boring. Life. Never boring no. in T.O., brother. Uh, Leafs corner, uh, unsullied by sponsorship since 2021, uh, has come to an end. Uh, tune in next week for the next edition of uh, Leafs Corner. This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Babbel. The best way to learn a language is through immersion. Living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you could still learn a language the second best way. And that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. They're designed by real people for real conversations, and Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, and rooted in real-life situations, while also being delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. I know... Uh, I've tried to learn other languages. I know English and French. Learning German has been very good for me with Babbel. Learning Spanish. I used to learn Spanish in elementary school. Been, been able to pick that up with Babbel as well. Really great app, and you should use it. Here's a special limited time offer for our listeners. Right now, get 50% off on a one-time payment for a lifetime Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash johnston. Get 50% off at babbel.com slash Johnston. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Johnston. Rules and restrictions may apply. Anyway, let's go over to uh, Calgary with uh, the most interesting name being dangled ahead of the NHL trade deadline. It, maybe it was Chris Tanev at one point. Maybe it was Noah Hannafin. Maybe it still could be him. But Jacob Markstrom is that guy right now. People are wondering if he could be dealt. The New Jersey Devils have emerged as a trade suitor for him. And reports are out there that they've been talking. And maybe it's been more than talk. And maybe there was something there that got kiboshed at the last second. Who knows? What are you hearing about this situation with Jacob Markstrom and the New Jersey Devils? And if anyone else is interested, let's get into it. Well, the Devils are a team that are looking at a lot of goaltenders. So, you know, it's it's not as though their sights are exclusively and only set on Jacob Markstrom. But, you know, among the goalies they could reasonably trade for, he he's arguably the best one, the most accomplished one. And, you know, as a bonus, in a sense, he's signed, you know, for a couple of years beyond this season. So it wouldn't just be a short-term addition in this case. You know, where I think it got to here of late is is there was a push to 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 take that to a trade that could actually happen and, and it it broke down or it sputtered over, you know, what I believe is a devil's need for, for Calgary to retain some salary to make the deal work. And, you know, it's it's a big ask for a team, even a team in Calgary situation, which is obviously going into some kind of retool, whatever you want to call it, but you know, the way salary retention works is it's on the books right through the end of the deal. And so it's not just the money, although the money is, I mean, you still got to go to your owner if you're the GM making that trade and say like, Hey, we, we might pay X million this year to not have this guy on our roster. Is that okay? Which, you know, I can't imagine having to ask someone to do that, but you know, that part aside, it's also a cap commitment on your, on your balance sheet for a couple of years. And you know, two years from now, you might look at that and be like, oh man, we got this dead money from Markstrom still on the books. And so, you know, where it's at is, is I don't think it's fully dead. I think New Jersey certainly wants to try to see if there's another way to get the deal done. If there's maybe some sort of creative solution, or maybe Calgary, you know, ultimately can get to a point where they're getting a return that makes it worth that salary retention. I, I don't have any reason to believe this actually got to Jacob Markstrom yet. He's got a full no move clause. We should remind 
So mm-hmm. I, I don't think he got to a point where he was yay or naying a trade. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that's that's the last thing that kind of happens. That's the formal piece that happens once the deal's in place. And they just didn't get to a point where a deal's in place. But, you know, we're still three weeks out from the trade deadline. Um, let's let's see where that goes. Let's see how it evolves. I, I don't know if there's another team in season that might make a play for Jacob Markstrom. I mean, I, I think it's conceivable that, you know, if the Devils and Flames don't get something done at this deadline, maybe we're talking about this as we get into the draft or the summer um, when other teams can look at maybe doing different things. But the Devils, I'm pretty confident, um, unless the bottom falls out here or something, you know, they're they're right on the cusp right now of, of playoff positioning. They, they, you know, we've seen a bounce back. They've got Jack Hughes back healthy. You know, I, I think that they're a team that's more than likely going to be adding a goaltender and, and they're looking at, they're looking at a big name and a, a big ad. And so that's, that's the best of where I can put it today. I, I, I don't have any reason to believe that it's, it's over, but you know, clearly it's, it's not an easy transaction to complete. Uh, could the devils be interested in possibly more than Markstrom? And they, they made their presence felt at the uh, flame sharks game yesterday with, with Scott Clemenson, the director of goaltender development, uh, Ryan Breen, who who manages their pro scouting was also there. Markstrom didn't play in that game for the flames against the sharks, but Hannafin and Tanev did as an example. It could, that could it be more than just Markstrom at this point? Well, I, I certainly could see New Jersey, adding a defenseman, you know, they've been out with Dougie Hamilton here for, for a long, long time, extended injury to him. And so I think that's reasonable to think they might also be looking at the sharks net though, too. Right. I mean, you, you got Kakanen uh, on the San Jose end of things. Who's, who is a rental goaltender um, who, despite playing on a team that's right at the bottom of the standings and has abysmal defensive results, you know, he's, he's actually, if you look at his numbers, faring pretty well in a system that isn't set up for success for a goaltender. And so, you know, I think that y- you have to conclude that there's probably two, two teams they were watching in that game uh, because, you know, the Sharks are a team that are going to be selling off players too. I, they don't have the types of players that Calgary does that either in name value or I think in potential impact, but you know, the, some of the acquisition costs might be cheaper. Some of the cap considerations uh, make those deals a little easier. So don't rule them out. I, you know, I think New Jersey's looked at, John Gibson at times through this year, I mean, he just has gone down with an injury. So we'll have to see what happens there, but you know, Gibson has an extra year than Markstrom three years beyond this season on his contract. So I think there might be a little concern about that, but you know, if you're looking for a common denominator here, uh, when you're, when you're talking about goalie conversations around the league, I, you know, New Jersey's pretty heavily involved in them and um, you know, they've got three weeks to kind of sort through it and, and, and hope that they can, arm their team with with what they need to get in the playoffs because that's that's far from a certainty uh, at this stage three weeks from the deadline the calgary flames remain the league's most interesting team when it comes to the deadline as far as i'm concerned cj let's go from calgary to columbus yarmo kekalainen yesterday fired from his job as general manager of the blue jackets i believe almost 11 years to the day he was hired in that position it seems as if uh, the Blue Jackets wanted a fresh perspective a couple of weeks from the NHL trade deadline and, of course, for the summer ahead. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, I think a lot of people were wondering about the timing of this. I mean, there's a couple factors, I think, to keep in mind. Jarmo Kekalainen, you know, was under – in a position where I think he, it was known that, that you know, he was under the spotlight. He was under the gun because he – had spent so long in Columbus with the team sputtering. This was meant to be a year. If you look at their off season last year, you know, trading for the likes of, of a Provorov, you know, initially hiring Mike Babcock as his head coach. I mean, it was clear that the blue jackets were trying to take a step forward this season uh, from the moves that management was making, you know, they weren't, they weren't intending to be where they are, which is decidedly right back in the, the NHL's draft lottery positioning. And, you know, I think it just got to be time. You know, when it comes to the time of why now, I, I'll I'll first offer a piece of advice. There's never the wrong time to make the right decision. Um, and, but also in this case, you know, John Davidson, the president of the team, who's taking over as interim GM. You know, he's he's been hobbled this year. He had, he had a back surgery and and hasn't been around the team as much as he normally would be. Probably wasn't in a position to step into this job prior to this. I, I, I'm not saying that's the exclusive factor here, but I think that that has to be taken into account. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, why didn't they fire him on November 10th? Um, but maybe maybe this, the circumstances weren't quite right. And, 
you know, look, this is still well in advance of the deadline. I think it gives them a long runway to to work through the potential candidates they're going to talk to. And and for as bad as it looks in the moment, in the standings, with everything that's happened in the recent history of this team, I actually think this is going to be a very appealing job um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, look, Yarmo Kekalainen got 11 years for the, from this ownership group. They, they've shown themselves to be patient. There's only ever been three general managers in the entire history of the Columbus Blue Jackets. So I think if you take that job, you can have some assurance or some idea based on the track record that you're probably going to get a real fair shake at, 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 you know, changing what's going on. They've got a really attractive group of prospects because they've been drafting, you know, they've, they've been retooling and drafting high for a couple seasons now. And I, I am of the opinion Columbus is a, a bit of a sleeping giant as a city. It's, it's a nice place to live. Um, as I say, stable from, from a front office perspective and yeah, it's they're they're not in a good spot right now. They they wanted to win more games on the ice this season, but I, I think if you're looking at taking that job, uh, you could do much much worse uh, in, in other situations around the league. Any names stand out to you as possible candidates? Mathieu Darche obviously would probably come to mind, if only because we've really, we've linked him to the last how many vacancies over the last few years. Uh, Jeff well, Gordon's I mean, name. We didn't just link him to too. vacancies. He's been he's been interviewed a fair bit too. I mean, he's been considered and he's for deserving those of those, mind you. But it's just it feels like he's a very easy name to plug in for those opportunities. Well, he's on your list of five or ten right off the like before before you even have to go too deep into it. He's definitely look. He was a Blue Jackets player, I believe. He was taking the expansion draft by them. Um, you know, and he's got the track record. He's got. He's had you know a lot of tutelage under Julian Brisebois in Tampa. Um, he makes sense, you know, Darren Dra- Dreger, my colleague at TSN threw out an interesting name and in Jeff Gorton, uh, who's currently the president in, in the Montreal Canes organization, but has worked with John Davidson with the Rangers, you know, Dreger was sort of speculating, you know, does it make sense to bring him in kind of a, like a Kyle Dubas type of role in Columbus where he's maybe the, the president and GM or whatever the titles end up being, but he has a lot of authority, but also still gets to put his hands on, on the day-to-day roster decisions, you know, Rick Nash, a longtime player of the Blue Jackets has been working in their front office and I know is thought of very highly. You know, maybe he's not the right time to make him GM, but maybe it is. I mean, look, that would be the Danny Breer model, right? Uh, you know, with Breer getting elevated to the, the big chair in, in Philadelphia last year. I could see him part of it. You know, there's been some whispers about would Mark Hunter make sense for them? You know, I don't think we're at the point where we can say it's it's this this person. We, it's too early to identify the favorite or anything like that. But I think that if you're looking at the collection of potential names, that's a pretty good place to start. And, you know, the Blue Jackets are going to have JD, their president, uh, be the interim GM in the short term here. He'll handle the trade deadline. And then, you know, there is a pretty long window before the draft, which is, you know, when ideally you'd like to have your your, your full-time GM in place. What about Eric Tulski in, in Carolina? I mean, I think anyone would be smart to hire Eric Tulski. I'm a big fan of, you know, the way he looks at the game. You know, his background is very unique. We've seen this in, in many other sports that, you know, in, in Major League Baseball, you've got guys who whose resume includes working at NASA, helping teams win the World Series or being the GM of teams that win the World Series. I mean, Eric comes from a similarly impressive background in terms of academia and has a long track record now in Carolina, right? He's He's... He's a hockey guy, if if you want to call it. I mean, his 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 entrance point to the org, to the industry was was unique and different. But you know, he's had a, had a long uh, tenure with the the Hurricanes. He's consistently been given more responsibility there and some title changes, and has a lot to do with a team that's won a lot of games over a number of years. Uh, have the Carolina Hurricanes. So you know, he was one of the people under consideration. I know in Pittsburgh last year, when ultimately Kyle Dubas got the job. You know, I think it's a matter of time before he's a GM. Um, I don't know enough about how Columbus ownership views, you know, things like analytics. Like I don't, I don't know how deeply they want to go down that road, but you know, I think, I think you'd be silly not to at least interview him and consider him. Okay. All right. That's as much as we can go in on the Columbus blue jackets. We're getting a lot in this week. I want to ask about two Jakes. So there's Jake Gensel in Pittsburgh who is out with an upper body injury for four weeks. And I have questions about him. I have questions about another Jake, Jake Allen in Montreal, because you know, the Montreal Canadians want to move I out. I thought of you were going to say Jake Wallman. Cause you want to talk about the whole gritty thing. 
So you're right. There are three Jakes we could <laughs> potentially talk about as well. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go in on, on Jake Wallman because uh, yesterday, I don't know if you saw, but uh, the Red Wings and the Canucks played against each other. And uh, at the end of the game, Nikita Zadorov was was kind of taunting Wallman and was trying to do his own version of the gritty, getting back at Wallman. It seemed like uh, he was getting targeted or he was targeting the Canucks players all night and their little back and forth. There's three three Jakes if you want to go there. Uh, well, which of you these, know... The gritty you celebration. Whatever, whatever you want. The gritty celebration. It should be noted. Came after Jake Wallman scored on a penalty shot in overtime last week. Yes. So pretty unique circumstances for that. And you know he put the celebration on. He's on home ice. I can understand why some Canucks players maybe didn't like it, but I also think Ian Cole had the great answer to that. I think it was he did an interview with Sportsnet. He's like, you don't want people to do that. Don't let them score. It was kind of a, a version of what you were saying earlier in the week on the Ridley Grigg thing um in in ottawa and so yeah i mean that look at it was i, I don't mind zador i've given it back to him a little bit i mean it seemed to me mostly in good fun yeah uh, i'm sure the league doesn't love all this stuff but you know it's it's not as though anyone you know we're not in an age where something like that happens and then someone two hands someone in the head and like if you remember 20 years ago in the nhl julian that kind of thing happened like you know, the whole Todd Bertuzzi, Steve Moore thing. Oh, was, yeah, I remember that. But that was retribution, right? And it was retribution from a previous game. And the league used to be very, very sensitive to that for obvious reasons. I just don't think we – It's it, we've – this is the, back to the generational argument. We've moved to a different era of hockey where I just don't think that it's on the same level. So if Zadorov at the end of the game wants to give it to him playfully like that, I, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um so yeah, that's that's my Jake Wallman hot take. I mean, Jake Gensel is probably a little more interesting for our, our listeners that are dialed into trade talk because you know, he, he went on long term injured reserve yesterday after you know taking a hit against Florida this week. You know, believe he might have broken a bone in his left hand, certainly cushioned his blow, uh, uh, cushioned the, the hit by by extending his, his hand. And you know, he, the, the the significant part of that is he's not eligible to return now to the Penguins lineup until the March 9th, 10th weekend on the other side of the trade deadline. And so, you know, one of the players that we thought if Pittsburgh becomes a seller would be perhaps the most sought after forward, certainly among the group of most sought after forwards is now not going to play again before the deadline. You know, Pittsburgh, I don't think has determined its course yet, but this certainly complicates things. I'm not going to sit here and say you can't trade Jake Ensel when he's, out injured for, you know, the, the couple of weeks leading into the deadline, but it's not ideal, you know, especially when you're talking about an injury to, you know, a shooting hand when, when part of what he does so well is shoot. Um, you know, the, the, the good news here is that the initial concern in Pittsburgh was that it, it was something much worse than a four week recovery timeline. The fact that it came in at four weeks, I think was viewed as, as a positive development and, you know, something that will heal. It's not a, you know, certain types of injuries don't necessarily, I think it's predictable that he'll, he'll heal, but you know, I think if you're a team, especially giving up big assets, you might be a little nervous now. Like what happens if there's some kind of setback, what happens if he's not as effective coming back, all those types of things. And and so this complicates the job, I would say of Kyle Dubas heading into the deadline, but it, it doesn't totally ruin it. You know, if anything, taking Jake Gensel out of the, the Penguins lineup might, might bring some clarity in the fact that it might be tough to win games here in the short term. And, and, you know, by the time they get closer to March 8th, it's going to be clear that they're they're headed in the wrong direction when it comes to the playoffs. And then it's about trying to maximize the, the return you can get for that player. Okay. Uh, and so we went through two of those Jakes. Anything, I mean, the, the Jake Allen thing, at least off yesterday, it seemed as if they might be close to being traded, but that has, has since been quickly refuted. I've seen Darren Dreger say that there have been some discussions about trading him, but nothing close, nothing imminent. It does. It does sure seem like he'll be gone by the March eighth deadline. Mm, I wouldn't go that far, actually. I oh, mean, okay. Look, the Montreal Canadiens have listened on Jake Allen all year, right? They, they've been carrying three goaltenders since day one of the season because they were worried ultimately about trying to pass Caden Primo through waivers because they were led to believe he was going to be claimed. I mean, you've gone this far. It's it's pretty clear where the things are going in Montreal. They've since extended Samuel Montembeau, the other goaltender in their crease. You know. You'd you think because Jake Allen is is you know certainly a, a good NHL goalie, a reliable NHL goalie, and he's signed through next year. You'd think that's a positive. I, I think it's turned to be a, 
a little bit of a challenging aspect in terms of trading him. Some teams have some concerns about, you know, adding him for this year and next for various reasons. I mean, maybe a team like look at Carolina, for example, which has had all kinds of injuries in the crease. Um, you know, it'd be hard to trade for Jake Allen when you already have Frederick Anderson, anti Ranta and Piotr Kochetkov all under contract for next season. Now you might want Jake Allen for the rest of this year, but that, that creates a real backlog, you know, going forward. You know, I, I mentioned New Jersey earlier in the show. I know that they've at least maybe been hot and cold on Allen, but they've, they, they've had conversations on him. You know, the Colorado rumor isn't fully out of the blue. I think the avalanche have at least looked there, but you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure what happened when it was re, you know reported that it was done because certainly nothing has been close. Nothing is, is remotely done. And I do think it's possible that, you know, because Jake Allen has an extra year in his contract that maybe he's not moved by March 8th, but then you see him traded when it comes to the off season. You know, I think that the Canadians and him are working well, you know, hand in hand together. He does have a limited no trade clause. There's some teams that, that he can control that he won't go to. Um, the field of teams he might be traded to, I think expands if you get to the off season. So he's, he's still prominently placed on the trade board. I got a fresh one of those coming on Monday. Uh, he's still going to be up there pretty high, but, but it's not a certainty that he's dealt. That, that's the best way I'd put it. All right. That's a lot of, uh, Jake content over the last few minutes. Actually, one other thing that came to mind, and it's with a Jack and less of a Jake, but did you see Jack Hughes chirp Victor Arvidsson in that Kings Devils game yesterday? I just saw the clip on, on, on Twitter. Yeah. That I think that's just the one clip we all need, but him going at him and saying, people pay to watch me play. Like there's a part of me that sees that and then likes the fact that a guy will go up and say that like, there's, there's something different about these players, these younger guys just doing stuff like this. It seems exciting. It seems they're willing to tap into their inner pettiness and, and, well, and I Jack like it. Hughes in particular has never lacked for confidence. No. Ever. So that, I mean, that's a, sp- and look at, I'm sure that's part of what makes him great, man. So, and, and he's a fantastic player. So, and he can, he can back it up. He's not just talking the talk. He walks the walk with, with how he plays. So I, I got no problem with that one. I like, I liked what he did. I'm glad we got to mention that real quick. Let's get to stick taps. Uh, do you have a stick tap? Should I start? We This is the part of the week where we show someone some love. You can do the cross-check option where you could do the opposite, but we normally prefer to spread love and positivity. On I'm bringing the love today, man. And and I have to give the love, I got to say, to our 100 percenters. Yes, sir. Because I am full meal culpa here was completely wrong in the episode earlier in the week when I guessed that there was maybe 20 of you that had listened to every episode because... I'm still getting messages in my Instagram DMs or, you know, on Twitter from people. And, and it's well North of 20 people that have directly reached out to me. I'm mm-hmm. sure some have reached out to you, or I'm sure perhaps I've even missed some of them. I don't, I don't have the number. We'll never have the number of who no. has listened to it or how many of our, our loyal listeners have listened to every episode, but it is well North of 20 of you. So I was maybe being, I don't know what it was. Maybe I was being too modest, too realistic, whatever it is. But uh, anyway, Shout shout out to the to the OGs to those that have been with us since day one and I was I was wrong I underestimated your, your the legions out there the people who've listened to every minute I've had people in my mentions and and my messages say they've listened to every minute and every day I've been getting messages since uh, you made that call out so thank you to all of the one hundred percenters out there we love you and we appreciate you very dearly. So you know what's weird? I didn't hear from Coburg Papa after that episode. I'm wondering, did he maybe, <laughs> did he maybe miss his first episode? He didn't even mention no, it to me. Oh, that's I don't, not true. I don't think so, but I haven't heard from him about it. So he didn't put his hand up and say he's 100% or at least in, in the last few days. I don't think you have to worry about his allegiance at all. That's that's the OG 100%. <laughs> what do you got, bud? Uh, Johnny Gaudreau is uh, my pick. Uh, he will be donating a thousand dollars for every point that he scores uh, f- in support of men's mental health. Uh, Patrick Line has been doing the same thing. Obviously, he's in the player assistance program, but he was trying to take up after uh, what Patrick Line was doing in Columbus. I think it's a really cool thing on on, on Johnny's part. Uh, we know over the last few days there were some comments made about Patrick Line on a podcast that uh, I won't I won't give them too much oxygen on that, but we all know how bad those comments were and and really disgusting to hear 
So to see the hockey community kind of rally around that in support of Patrick Laine is great, but to also see Johnny Gaudreau do something as noble as that is also worthy of a stick, stick tap and more uh, from the hockey world. So I wanted to show some love to, uh, to Johnny Gaudreau this week. Love that. And I should mention, and I am truly sorry that we've been all over the map with our scheduling the last two weeks. So thanks for everyone for sticking with us. We got a lot of jobs. Sometimes we're juggling a lot. But we are, we are going to be, we got three weeks to the trade deadline. We're going to be on Mondays and Thursdays. And not only that, there'll probably be an emergency pot or two in there, depending what happens. So we're going to, we're, we're going to get back on schedule here. You know what the best part of, um, of those emergency podcasts are? You know what the best part about those are? You never know when they're coming. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you probably do. Cause it's going to have to be a pretty significant move for it to get to that. So it's, it's, it's going to come when something big happens and, I'm I'm feeling good that that we're three weeks out from the deadline and there's not that much action yet. Like I feel like it's like the the pressure is kind of building. You know, it's like the shaking up can of coke right now around the league. Nothing, nothing's really burst, but I, you can sense the urgency going up and the conversations going up. So, I think we're gonna have an exciting few weeks if you're if you love the transactions game. I think so too. Put all the Mentos you want in that uh, bottle of coke <laughs> and let it blow up. Get the question, get your questions in now for Ask CJ. We'll get to them on the Monday edition of the CJ Show. Subscribe to the podcast, whether on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, on the YouTube page as well for the SDPN, and check out the rest of the page for more great content. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long, and peace. Have a great weekend. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie.